This film is brought to you by New York Life and its dedicated agents. Proud sponsors of the NFL's team highlight films. New York Life, the company you keep. For 23 years, he was part of some of the most memorable moments in Steelers history. Bradshaw running out of the pocket, looking for somebody to throw to, fires it downfield. And there's a collision. That's caught out of the air. The ball is pulled in by Frank O'Hare. Bradshaw is back, and he's going to squad. The squad makes a circus catch in the end zone. Downfield, there goes Stallworth. He pulls it in at the 30, the 20, and it's a touchdown for Pittsburgh on the ball to Stallworth. The ball is down. Gary Anderson kicks it, sends it down. It is good. Gary Anderson kicks it from 50 yards. For 23 years, he taught young men to believe in themselves and taught veterans how to achieve their ultimate dreams. For 23 years, the Pittsburgh Steelers took the field under his steady guidance. Now four Super Bowl championships and more than 200 victories later, Charles Henry Knoll has decided it's time to move on. The only thing that I can say is thank you. I mean, this is to everybody, to the city of Pittsburgh, to uh, the coaches that I've been associated with through the years, to the players, especially the players, because those are the guys that, uh, that make it happen on the field. Those are the guys that uh, meant uh, our success and uh, you know it's been great memories and uh, after 39 years in it I have to step back and uh, see what the, the flowers smell like for a little bit. And so while one era comes to an end in Pittsburgh a new one begins. It's my pleasure to introduce coach Bill Collins. The task at hand is clear and simple. What we must do is take the credibility and the stability of the front office, the wealth of young and proven players, and we're going to unite that. And we'll bring back the pride and the tradition that's long been associated with the Pittsburgh Steelers, and more importantly, the great people Pittsburgh. For the Steelers, the 1991 season was a roller coaster of emotions, beginning with a quick ride to the top on opening day. And Brister takes the snap of the shotgun. Steps out to the left. Fires downfield and completes the pass down in the goal line to the crossing receiver, Chris Calloway. And the Steelers hit their first TD of the new season. Gary Anderson hit his first four field goals of the season as the third most accurate kicker in NFL history helped the Steelers build a 19-3 fourth quarter lead. San Diego eventually closed within six points. And when starting quarterback Bubby Brister was shaken up, the Steelers called upon second-year man Neil O'Donnell. Facing a critical third and 19 at his own 11, O'Donnell made his first NFL completion count in a big way. O'Donnell throwing up field, pulled in by Stone at the 14. He comes off the side. Of Stone is loose. Stone at the 50. Stone at the 40. Go, Stoney. The 20. The 10. It's a touchdown for the Steelers. One week later, the Steelers would give up 52 points in a loss at Buffalo, but then rebound to smother the Patriots. A loss in Philadelphia was then followed by a crushing of the Colts. <laughs> After five games, the Steelers were three and two, but they were also inconsistent and it showed on a Monday night against the Giants. After Pittsburgh fell behind big, Neil O'Donnell came on to lead the Steelers back in a furious fourth quarter rally. 
O'Donnell's touchdown pass to Eric Green with less than a minute to play amazingly tied the score, but a last-second field goal allowed the defending world champions to escape with a victory. The heartbreaking defeat marked the beginning of an agonizing four-game losing streak in which it seemed every bounce of the ball played a cruel joke on Pittsburgh. A potential game-tying touchdown slipped away in Denver, and suddenly the once optimistic Steelers were three and six and virtually eliminated from playoff contention. Too many opportunities had gotten away. Too many games had been given away. All that was left to play for was Steeler pride. And finally, in week 11, the ball began to bounce Pittsburgh's way. After spotting the Bengals a 17-3 lead, the Steelers roared back. Gerald Williams' fumble return began a second-half comeback that sent the game to overtime, where Pittsburgh made sure it didn't let this one get away. Greg Lloyd's strip and recovery put the Steelers in position to finally put their losing streak behind them and look ahead positively toward the remainder of the season. And a fake. O'Donnell is going to pass. And there's the big guy, Green, at the four. Takes it for the touchdown. Now you said, we're going for the whole ball of wax. We're hungry. We're going to go for the big play. And the Steelers have beaten the Bengals. The icy chill of winter can be merciless to many teams, but historically, as the temperature drops, the Steelers turn up the heat. As was the case in week 13 against the division-leading Oilers, the Steelers intercepted Warren Moon five times, with two coming from rookie Sean Vincent in his first NFL start. Come on, Big Ed's out! Come on, Big Ed, let's go! Pittsburgh limited Houston to just 24 yards rushing as the Oilers were out-muscled and out of their element. It's too cold for this way today, man. With Houston's offense frozen to a halt, Neil O'Donnell provided the spark to jumpstart a Steeler upset. The snap to O'Donnell. O'Donnell has time, and he's going deep on the far side of the field, and there is Stone to pull it in. Stone goes into the end zone. Touchdown, Pittsburgh. And we are seeing an upset now in the making. O'Donnell hands it off. The ball carried by Pittsburgh's Warren Williams to a touchdown. The Steelers' surprising victory was the first of three late-season wins over division rivals. In game 15, Bubby Brister returned to the lineup and burned the Bengals by hooking up with tight ends Keith Cash, number 85, and Adrian Cooper. A fake to Worley. Then Brister rolling right, completing the pass to Cooper at the 40 over the 35 to 30. Fighting his way over the 25 to 20, 50 to 10, the 5. It is a touchdown, Pittsburgh. Cooper was the Steelers' rookie of the year. And in the season finale the following week, it was the youth of Pittsburgh's defense that rose up to shut down the Browns. Number 57, linebacker Gerald Williams recorded four sacks, but it was second-year cornerback Richard Shelton who was named the AFC's Defensive Player of the Week with three interceptions, including one for the game-clinching score. Kozar looking for Horn, fast picked off. Here comes the turnover. Here comes the touchdown. Richie Shelton lining up a great afternoon. Touchdown, Pittsburgh. Richie goes into the end zone, rolls on his back. Oh, did he pick off Kozar? For the fourth straight season, the Steelers won three of their last five games, but their seven victories left them one game shy of the playoffs. Still, their ability to pull together at the end of the year was a tribute to their head coach, whose final message to the fans was greeted with a standing ovation. Four days after the 1991 season ended, Chuck Knoll exited as Steelers head coach, the same way he entered in 1969, without flash, without fanfare. But his 23 years of quiet guidance left lasting impressions on the men he molded 
into champions. Chuck had that vision and what we wanted to get accomplished, and the players bought into it, and it was very simple. It wasn't magical stuff. We weren't trying to trick people. It was basic, fundamental things that you grew up with, that every coach had drilled into your head, but it all came to a light. We won championships because Chuck Noll could instill that kind of the chemistry, that kind of winning attitude we had in our football team. And, uh, you know, we could have gotten by without some players, but we don't win championships without Chuck Noll. He understood not just football, but he understood life. I uh, always liked the saying that Chuck had that you never arrived. And at the time, uh, uh, what he was saying to us was, sure, you, you won a championship, but there are more mountains to climb and that you never really get there. There's always more you can do. You can always get better. And that philosophy that I picked up from Chuck has, has really been instilled in me and I think instilled in a lot of the players who played under Chuck. It's amazing today that when I have the opportunity to go out and speak to groups and to businesses, is that so much of what I talk about and so much of what I believe in had, had come from Chuck Nolan, had come from his philosophy on how you achieve, how you become a success. And it's so much a part of me. And as I talk to other teammates, Chuck is a part of every one of them, and they all admit that. As I go through life, I always relate back to what Chuck Knoll taught us, and I have enormous respect for the man, most as a person, second as a coach, and uh, I'm just glad I had the good fortune to uh, play for him. He's an extraordinary person. Around the same time Chuck Knoll was forming his Steelers dynasty, a future head coach was growing up just 10 minutes from Three Rivers Stadium. In the Pittsburgh suburb of Crafton, Bill Cower starred at Carlinton High School. He then went on to North Carolina State, where as a senior linebacker, he was named team captain and most valuable player. His pro career took off in 1980 when as a free agent, he joined the Cleveland Browns as a special teams player and reserve inside linebacker. Number 53 was an undersized overachiever, one who never backed down from a ball carrier, not even old hometown heroes like Rocky Blyer. Bill Cower as a player was one who uh, wasn't the most talented one that was never very gifted with uh, great speed or size, but uh, a guy you can count on, a guy that was going to be there each Sunday, and uh, a guy who would make the most of every opportunity that was given to him. Cower played five blue-collar seasons for the Browns and Eagles before a knee injury forced him to the sidelines. It was then that he unleashed a white-hot intensity through coaching. We are going to dominate this football game. I'll tell you what, the tempo of this football game will be set the whole second half of this kickoff. Let's go! We've come too damn far to be denied. Let's go! Let's go! Cower lit a fire under the Browns' special teams in 1985 and 86, and then took over as secondary coach the next two seasons. The Browns' defense ranked fourth in the AFC in 1988, and the following year, Cower was named defensive coordinator in Kansas City. Under Cower, the Chiefs fielded the AFC's number one defense in 1989. And for the past three seasons, Cower has driven the unit with a burning passion for the game. I think enthusiasm is something that comes from within. What Sundays give you is an opportunity to let all that out. And I think that you can't curtail how any individual acts on Sundays as long as they work within the framework uh, of the structure that you've set. Bill Cower was named head coach of the Steelers at the age of 34. And the NFL's second youngest head coach hopes to begin his new era by turning Pittsburgh's hungry defenders loose in 1992.
In 92, the defensive line will need to turn up the heat on opposing quarterbacks. Gerald Williams has become a solid fixture at nose tackle. While veterans Donald Evans and number 93 Keith Willis can still make big impacts. More pressure from youngsters like number 64 Kenny Davidson, Craig Beasy, and number 97 Aaron Jones will help ease the job for one of the NFL's most physical secondaries. Whether it's safety or on special teams, Carnell Lake always seems to be around the ball, as does cornerback David Johnson, number 44, 1991's leading interceptor, Thomas Everett. But the secondary is still anchored by number 26, cornerback Rod Woodson. In 1991, Woodson was voted to his third straight Pro Bowl. But the biggest impact on defense came from a first-time Pro Bowler. Punishing pass catchers, stripping ball carriers, harassing quarterbacks, linebacker Greg Lloyd was indeed a nasty sight for opposing offenses in 1991. In his third year as a starter, Lloyd's quickness to the ball helped him blossom into the Steelers' big play man on defense, and he was named the team's most valuable player for 1991. In 1992, another up-and-coming linebacker could be just as big a force. Number 57, third-year man Gerald Williams, led the team with nine sacks despite starting just four games. Others like number 90, Huey Richardson, can't wait to get their hands on the ball and join Rob McGovern, number 55, Jerry Osafsky, and the team's leading tackler, Hardy Nickerson, at Pittsburgh's core of young linebackers. And of course, the two veterans who continue to make the most of their opportunities are number 50, David Little, and Brian Hinkle. Kelly backs up. Kelly throws. Pick off. It is taken in by Hinkle at the 45 over the 50. The 45, the 40 down the sideline. He's going to go. He stays on his feet. Hink is on his way. 55 yards for a touchdown of the interception. The Steelers' defense, a blend of old pros and young hopefuls, looking to begin the new era with a bang in 1992. Entering the 1992 season, Bill Cowher will be afforded a special luxury in the Steelers' offense. Two proven quarterbacks with NFL experience. Two men who each started eight games a year ago, Bubby Brister and Neil O'Donnell. Both Bubby and Neil give us an opportunity to have two guys that have lined up under fire who have had success in the National Football League, and I think it's a very healthy situation to have, especially in a time where um, people are looking for that position to provide leadership. I think we have two individuals who have proven that they can do that. Statistically, O'Donnell and Brister were nearly identical in 1991. But what these quarterbacks give the Steelers can't be measured by mere numbers. Both are mobile, gifted athletes with the skill to improvise the beastliest play into a thing of beauty. In 1992, each can count on the consistency of Lewis Lips, whose 55 catches last year made him the team's leading receiver for the fourth straight season. But Lips wasn't the Steelers' most potent threat in 1991. The electrifying speed of Dwight Stone makes him a threat to go all the way at any time. Brister, firing a field, completes the pass to Stone at the 50, down over the 40. The 30 breaks into the open, the 20, the 10, touchdown, Pittsburgh. In 1991, 
the Steelers drafted two potential starting receivers in Jeff Graham and number 89 Ernie Mills and looked to get them more involved in the offense in 1992. At tight end, Pittsburgh is already solid with number 87, Adrian Cooper, along with a man who's on the verge of becoming one of the biggest stars in the game. Big day, big day, big day. Every day is a big day. For Eric Green, every day truly is a big day. At 6'5", 275 pounds, Green is football's biggest target and a giant headache for opposing coaches who have never seen anything quite like him. The size of that son of a oh, He's back and under the rush, he fires the ball. It's a touchdown as Green comes across and that's like throwing it to a Sherman tank. Green was nearly impossible to stop without an army of tacklers and his second year battering ram rolled to the team lead in touchdown catches for the second straight season. And here's Brister looking for Green. He's wide open at the 15, the 10, the 5, and into the end zone. Touchdown! Green's size makes it like having an extra lineman on the field where he can help number 62, Tunch Ilkin and company clear the way for Merrill Hodge and the Pittsburgh ground game. In 1991, Hodge led the Steelers in rushing for the third time in four years, riding the blocks of tackles Ilkin and John Jackson, center Dermonte Dawson, and guard Carlton Hasselrig. In 1992, more holes need to be opened for backs Warren Williams, Leroy Thompson, and number 29, Barry Foster. And to give us to Foster. Foster takes off to the left. He's moving 50, 45, 40. Coming down the sideline, 35. Knocks a man down over the 30, 25. Down to the 20. He's still on his feet. He's got a touchdown. He come down around that 30-yard line of Buffalo when he shook off Mark Kelsey on a fly. And then he got a block. He got a block from you. Bench it was Adrian Cooper, the big rookie tight end. Hard running by Barry Foster. Gets the block from Cooper. And the Steelers score. Hard running, hard blocking, hard hitting. Textbook fundamentals that help write a legendary story in Pittsburgh and ones that will help turn the page on a new chapter in Steeler football. In 1991, the Steelers fielded one of the NFL's youngest teams, a team that included 11 rookies along with several young faces hungry to tap their potential. In 1992, these young Steelers will be guided by a new hand, a young coach looking to make his own mark and etch his own name in history. A legendary era has ended in Pittsburgh. A bright new one is about to unfold. I know what we need to do. I know how we need to do it. And the thing that we have to do is surround ourselves with people who have the same common goal and obtaining what we all want to get, which is a championship. It's not going to be easy. It's going to get bumpy somewhere along the ride, but I've always thought that anything worthwhile in life will never come easy. And if you're willing to pay the price and you surround yourself with good people, I don't think there's anything that you can't obtain.